Welcome to this presentation from Imperus on RISC-V verification using design verification techniques. Now, nobody would ever contemplate designing a chip without simulation prior to doing a tape out. And at Imperus, we believe that nobody should develop embedded software without simulation because the, the issues that impact upon the product itself are similar in terms of their overall cost. Um, we develop tools such as debuggers, simulators, uh, profilers, in order to help with the verification of that software that runs on the virtual platform. RISC-V itself presents a lot of new challenges as well as opportunities. It's a, a new and open ISA which is managed by uh, RISC-V International. Uh, and it means that any designer can build a processor implementation that conforms to the ISA itself. Now, traditionally, uh, IP has tended to come from uh, single sources of companies whereby they have developed the, the ISA and they've also developed the RTL to conform to that particular ISA. And the testing of this has also been done by those same vendors. And if you were to look at ARM, for example, they have something like 10 to the 15 instructions per ISA in order to ensure that these um, uh, cores meet whatever their specifications have divine, dis, defined to be. And this, this produces a real challenge for the RISC-V industry that we need to be able to come up with methods of maintaining equivalent kinds of performance and verification that the traditional CPU manufacturers have managed to achieve. So how does one go about the design and verification process? Well, part of this work obviously is the design of the RTL, but then the verification um, is equally as important. And this means uh, hiring a team or having internal expertise in order to do the work, developing a plan, obtaining the tools in order to perform these um, uh, complex activities. This includes uh, models, uh, technologies such as System Verilog, uh, UVM, and then also to get all these working with a set of tests. And those tests can be obtained either from third parties or created uh, by, by your own teams. And those, those tests themselves that are created can either be directed tests exercising specific functionalities or pseudo random tests which try to push your design into corners. A key part of this verification process is to have a reference model which we you can use in order to compare the behavior of your design against when you're performing your testing. Due to the highly configurable nature of RISC-V itself in terms of what's defined within the uh, debug privilege and user specifications, then any model which performs as a reference has to also incorporate those same capabilities to be either enabled or disabled or selected from variants to meet the same behavior. And in the case of the Imperius RISC V envelope model, this contains over 130 built in configuration parameters. And, and these parameters cov cover a number of uh, sort of levels of, of capabilities. So at the sort of highest level, we have the specification versions for privilege user and debug and all the different uh, releases that they have gone through. And then moving down, we sort of have the parameters that control those behaviors defined within those specifications. So in the case of simple parameters, we can define the MISA subsets, whether it's 3264, the type of extensions that you have for integer, multiply, atomic, etc. And then we have other uh, capabilities, such as being able to define the behavior on certain aspects which are not defined by the spec itself, but are left down to the implementation. So does your uh, core handle misaligned code and data accesses, or does it trap out to a uh, trap handle in order to resolve that? And then we have the far more complex parameters, such as individual fields and existence of CSRs in terms of uh, their behavioral configuration and also major parts within your core. You know, does it have a clint? How is the clint configured? Is it, does it have a click? Does it have a debug um, specification? And in fact, further to this, you'll notice that when you read the specifications that a lot of usage of the terms should and can is used, whereby the behavior of an implemented feature is left to the discretion of the implementer itself so that you can decide whether a MISA CSR is read write or read only and whether or not it returns a value or returns zero. 
Uh, additionally, things like the MTVEC register, which must be implemented but can contain a hardwired read only value. So these are all alternates that de determine the, the actual implementation specifics, which are still within the uh, framework of what can be termed as a RISC-V compliant device. To illustrate this point further, here you can see a partial extract of the configuration of the CV32E40P on top of what is our basic envelope model. And so we define which user version specification is used, the privileged version, the debug version, how many local interrupts. And there's quite an extensive list of these items that exist in the actual model. So let's now take a look at some of the verification techniques which we use when comparing the RTL design under test against the reference model. So if we look at the first method, uh, which we've termed the self-check, this is where the test itself has its result embedded within the test itself so that it can perform the check at the end of the test. So consider something like a simple addition where you add three to five, then you know the result is eight. So you can perform the uh, expressions, you know, adding three to five, and then you can assert that at the end of the test, the result is what you expected, the result is eight. And then, then you've defined what your go, no, go status is, that either the, the, the resultant value is eight or it is not, and that determines whether it's a, a pass or a fail. The advantage to this is that it's very easy to implement. It's uh, simply a case of executing the program and you get a Boolean result at the end of it, which indicates whether or not the test has passed or failed. The disadvantage is that very little of the detailed internal state is exposed out as part of the verification process. So this means that you know any intermediate state changes are not captured and are not compared um, because all you're really doing is uh, ensuring that the final result is the correct result. A very simple example of this is if we had this program which uh, takes two numbers A and B, assigned values three and four, and then we perform a test on the result which has been applied to C. Uh, the expected value will be seven, so if C equals seven it will print the fact that the test has passed. It will also assign the value zero to the status. Else, if it's not equal to seven, then the status is assigned one and the test failed message is printed. And finally, at the end of the test, the status value is returned. So under a good, good condition, status is zero. So the second method uh, which we describe here is the signature comparison method. And actually, this is what's used as part of the RISC V compliance testing. And what happens here is that it's effectively an extension of the previous example, except that uh, more sample points are captured. So rather than just sampling the final result, which is a Boolean of a um, an assertion, what we actually do here is we check sample points throughout the execution of the program at critical stages. And in fact, in the signature comparison uh, type approach, the result is not determined by the, the test itself. It's determined by a post-process operation that compares the signature that's produced. Uh, so the main advantage here is that more state is captured than the previous self-check example. The, the disadvantage is, is that the captured state itself is a bit ad hoc. You know, the sample points uh, are determined by whoever writes the program and determines which bits they want to actually capture as part of the um, signature that's produced. And again, you know, there's little detailed internal state that's exposed using this approach. So again, uh, what we'd see in this case would be a source file which would produce a signature in memory of five results of those five expressions and a golden reference of the expected results. And those expected results would be checked at runtime against the results produced by the design and test. Now we look at the method of performing a, a trace log comparison, and this is the method used as part of the RISC V DV testing uh, done by Google. This uh, enables us to capture some additional internal state representation at the retirement of an instruction, and this could include the disassembly, the user registers, the system registers, and also the operating mode of whether it's in user mode, debug mode, uh, machine mode, etc. 
It's performed as a, a two-step process whereby you run your executable on the DUT, you run the executable on the reference model, and then you post-process the results and do a comparison. Now, the real advantage of this is that you have the potential for detailed captured state, as I mentioned, you know, the, all of the disassembly, register state and operating modes. But this is really dependent upon the processes that are running and what data they can extract from their state. The real disadvantage, unfortunately, is that it's almost impossible to synchronize externally generated asynchronous events. So uh, the arrival of interrupts, the arrival of debug requests, and if you have interrupts, uh, so if you have instruction data stalls, then it, it's almost impossible to synchronize those. Additionally, a problem with this type of approach is if you have runaway execution, whereby the program gets into a bad state in, in either of the processes, either the DUT or the reference model, uh, usually what you have to, is, have to have is some kind of bailout condition so that it doesn't run for infinity and generate huge log files. And so here you can see the flow of uh, processes that occur as part of the Chips Alliance uh, work that's been done using the uh, Google RISC-V DV test generator. Uh, you effectively generate a, uh, a, an ELF file that can be run on both the RTL and also the reference model, in this case the Imperius ISS. Both of them then produce log file outputs containing trace information such as the general purpose registers and disassembly of instructions given the PC. And then there's some compare routine. Um, but as, as mentioned, you know, this, the, these two processes run independently of each other. And therefore, if there's any kind of divergence, this is only detected at the point where the comparison is done. It's not detected at the point where the divergence occurs. So finally, we come to the step and compare method of uh, execution, which is where we have full state comparison running in a single process. And so we run until there's a lockstep of uh, instruction retirement, both in the RTL and in the reference model. And then we can compare the state of the uh, two devices in the single process. The real advantage here is that we can have highly detailed captured state as part of this comparison. So comparing all the GPRs, CSRs, the mode of operation, even uh, any uh, registers that are not usually visible. Uh, so long as you can access them through the simulation APIs, then they can also be considered as part of the state comparison. A, a big advantage of this is that you can synchronize externally generated events such as your debug requests or your interrupt requests that, that arrive at the uh, core or at the uh, reference model. And this then means that because they're, 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 they're synchronized, that, that the program execution remains in sync at the point where branches, sorry, where interrupts are taken or debug mode causes switches from other operating modes. And if you get differences in the results, you get an immediate report of the state divergence. So for example, if uh, a branch is taken in one but not taken in another, then you'll get an immediate difference reported to you telling you that a problem has occurred without going off and, and generating lots of useless uh, data for comparison later. I guess the only disadvantage in this type of environment is that there is some effort required in order to ensure you have synchronization of the architectural and microarchitectural representations. And, and you know, uh, this, this isn't a trivial exercise, but the value in putting in the effort in the early stages is huge in terms of being able to do lots of additional testing. So here we see the flow implemented by the Open Hardware Group for Step and Compare. It actually looks very similar to the previous uh, diagram that I showed. The main difference is that this is a single process now. And so what's actually happening is that both of these representations of the model are running at the same time in the same process, which means that the step and compare is done at runtime rather than as a post-process operation. So now you've got to the point where you've got an environment that you have your RTL and some reference available to you that you can perform some comparison to ensure that the behavior you're implementing is matched by whatever reference you're comparing against. Uh, the real goal now is to exercise that to its fullness and you can do this by obtaining some externally sourced 
uh, test suites and you can also do this by generating your own test suites and further enhancing that with some uh, random generated uh, instruction streams. Uh, in terms of the test suites you, you would find available, there's a number of suites out there, such as the RISC-V compliance suite on the RISC-V foundation site, the RISC-V tests, which are a set of benchmarks, and also the Imperus RISC-V tests, which uh, Imperus have developed in order to test some of the newer extensions, such as the bit manipulation and the uh, vector extensions. So very quickly, if we were to look at the Imperus RISC-V test, you'll see that we have generated a suite of tests against all of the extensions listed here. And what we also describe is the kind of coverage that we achieve with those tests. This is quite an important factor that we'll come on to shortly, uh, which is the coverage of the test that you're using. And to complement the directed tests in uh, the test suites I just showed, there are also a number of test generators as well, including RISC-V-DV from Google, Force RISC-V from Futureway, uh, RISC-V Torture, which was one of the uh, very early uh, test generators, um, and Valtrix Sting, which is a, a, a very smart tool which um, runs in and, and actually does the checking inside of the virtual platform or the RTL that you're actually executing. So it's kind of a hybrid between um, performing uh, test generation and also performing validation uh, within, within the program itself. So let's just recap a little bit on where we are. We've got to a point where we have uh, an environment where we can execute code on the DUT and the reference model and ensure that we have state equivalence. And this is really is a prerequisite to, to ensure that we've got correct behavior. Now, if state equivalence is achieved between the DUT and the reference model, then this leaves the following remaining question, which is how well have the test I've executed explored the potential state space and pushed my design into corners to expose any potential issues? Well, for any given test, the state equivalence between the DUT and the reference model is a single data point. Uh, it's a measure of design correctness, but it's only a data point in terms of the coverage. So using functional coverage, this gives us the ability to determine the overall quality of all the tests when aggregated together. And so by using cover points in our functional coverage examination, what this does for us is it finally provides the overall completeness of the DUT correctness. So let me give a very quick demonstration here of the environment I'm showing in this slide, which is we have the RTL of the CV32E40P running in system Verilog side by side and running in lockstep with an instantiation of the reference model provided by uh, the Imperus OVP model for the exact configuration of that device. What does this actually look like in real life? So here we see an environment whereby we have the instantiation of the OVP processor model acting as the reference alongside the RTL. And we can use all the views available inside the system Verilog environment here. So we're running this in cadence and we can see all of the signals that are coming from the RTL and also the reference model. And we can debug the code executing on the model as well. As we step through here, we can see that we're updating the instructions as they're executed, as well as the traces being added to in this bottom window down here on the left. We have complete visibility of the internals through the APIs that are provided through the Imperis debugger. So we can see all of our core registers, we can see all of our machine control state registers, we can just about see everything there is to be seen within the context of the application that's running on this processor model in this environment. And in the test bench, in the background, of course, as we've already described, there's a step and compare going on whereby all of the exposed states, so all of our GPR, CSR, are being compared in both environments at the same time. And if there's any divergence, then we'll get a UVM error at that point where divergence occurs. And so having gone through all these stages where we've constructed an environment whereby we have a reference model to confirm the state correctness of our RTL implementation. We've got a suite of tests which have proven that we have the required coverage for the design we've created. It's simply a case now of executing the RISC-V compliance suite and ensure that the suite passes. Now we have a compliant core. 
Thanks for your time today. For more information on Imperus products and tools, please visit imperus.com. And for all of our processor models and example platforms, please visit ovpworld.org. The free reference model RIS-5 OVP SIM now includes RIS-5 vector extensions test suite examples and is available at the link shown here on the slide. During the RIS-5 Summit 2020, please visit the virtual exhibit hall for live discussions and demos with the Imperus team. Thanks for watching.